Hello and welcome to the informational webinar for the fiscal year 2023 STEM Talent Challenge, which is run by the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship here at the U.S. Economic Development Administration, or EDA. This webinar, as well as additional resources, including frequently asked questions and tutorials for filling out standard forms, can be found at eda.gov slash funding slash programs stem slash stem hyphen challenge the website listed on this slide today i will start by going over who is eligible to apply for this program and the specifics of the funding offered then i'll go over the basics of our office the office of uh, office of innovation and entrepreneurship and our flagship program build to scale i'll then shift to the stem talent challenge and its origin origins and design particularly as it relates to Build to Scale. Then I'll talk about the goals for this challenge and what we are looking for in terms of program implementation. Next, I'll really dig into how to apply and let you know how applications will be scored. I'll then go over some of the previously awarded projects so that you can get an idea of what we look for in successful applications. Finally, I will review some frequently asked questions that may help you as you put together your application. The eligible entities for this program are determined by its statute, Section 30 of the Stevenson Widler Technology Innovation Act of 1980. So these are the same as in previous years of this program. The following entities are eligible to apply under this funding opportunity. Cities, counties, states, other political subdivisions of a state and Native American tribes, nonprofit organizations, public private partnerships, federal laboratories or science research parks, institutions of higher education, economic development organizations, or a consortium of any of the previously mentioned eligible entities. More information about these entity types can be found in both the NOFO and the frequently asked questions. Both of these documents can be found on the STEM website. Now that we have talked about who is eligible to apply, let's talk about the funding amounts that you can request, the total funding available, and the minimum match. Since we combined last year's $2 million appropriation with this year's $2.5 million appropriation, EDA has a total of $4.5 million for this year's challenge. Applicants may request up to 500,000, all of which must be put towards program implementation. As with previous years, a minimum one-to-one -one match is required. In order to put together a successful application, it is important to understand the work that OIE does and how this program fits into that framework. You may recognize the graphic above as a reinterpretation of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Instead of looking at individual needs, this graphic depicts the needs of a community. Similar to Maslow's hierarchy, in order to get to the next level, the previous needs to be achieved. Where Maslow looked at physiological needs such as air, water, and food as the base of the pyramid, we consider the basic infrastructure to be the base for a community. That is, you need roads and bridges before you can even consider moving to the next level. Technology infrastructure takes the place of safety needs. You need broadband internet to support the needs of businesses and residents. Business support, such as qualified talent, is the next level, as structures are needed to help community businesses to grow and succeed. Once these supports are in place, a community needs innovation engines that turn ideas into innovations. With these needs achieved, a healthy ecosystem exists. OIE likes to say that we operate in the space between business support and innovation engines. We fund projects that are designed to help communities innovate and commercialize these innovations, helping communities to build healthy ecosystems. We look for communities who have the first three tiers in place so that they can create scalable businesses and new jobs. In order to innovate and thrive, businesses need these three components. Our Build to Scale program addresses the capital need through our capital challenge and the need for entrepreneurship support through our venture challenge. But these are only two components and an innovative business cannot thrive without the talent to help execute. 
It was with this in mind that we created the STEM Talent Challenge, which is designed to help generate the talent needed to drive innovation. In this challenge, we are looking for applicants that are creating and implementing STEM talent development systems that complement their region's innovation economy. We are looking for applications where the talent development strategies, STEM talent, and regional innovation economy all work together. Strong proposals will demonstrate that the talent created and the means of developing that talent will meet the needs of regional employers looking to fill quality jobs. There should be a clear tie-in for how the project would not only produce STEM talent, but produce that talent to spur future innovation and growth in the region. Each project is required to complete and or reference a pre-application needs assessment. This pre-application needs assessment is designed to help make sure that projects align with the talent needs of regional employers and that training would have a high likelihood in resulting in good paying jobs. We were not prescriptive on the format of the needs assessment and it can be informal or formal. An example of a formal assessment may be a regional comprehensive economic development strategy or SEDS or an equivalent document. An informal assessment may be a survey conducted to area employers to determine their talent and skills needs. Regardless of the means of collection, these assessments should show that the regional businesses have an immediate need for skilled workers, and this should inform the development of relevant skills training. Projects should be responsive, that is, again, the development of training should be tied to immediate talent needs of regional employers. Now let's move on to talk about the goals of this program so that you can frame your application to meet these goals. All projects should aim to achieve each of the three goals listed on the next three slides. The first program goal is to develop STEM-focused work-based learning and training. On this end, projects should include training models that provide workers with the experience and skills needed to succeed in real-world job situations. These could include a registered apprenticeship, fellowship, internship, et cetera, but they are not limited to existing industry definitions. Projects should, where possible, include some or all of the components of the registered apprenticeship model, that is, business involvement, structured on-the-job training, related instruction, rewards for skills gains, and or culmination in a nationally recognized credential. Most importantly, as we discussed, training should clearly align with the talents and talent needs of those driving innovation in the region, and it should result in job placement for participants and high wage employment in high growth industries. We would also like to see projects that increase the innovation capacity of the project's region. On this end, projects should focus on connecting regional innovation stakeholders and employers with the workforce and talent development leaders and training providers. Projects should truly be driven by the talent needs of those employers at the forefront of innovation. Projects should enable a region's technology startups and innovative companies to hire locally, grow their teams, and scale their businesses faster. Applicants may contain letters from innovative partners that show these partnerships. As we discussed, on an earlier slide, we see talent development as a key factor to driving innovation. Without qualified talent, innovation is stalled. We are looking to fund organizations who are driving regional innovation through worker training. Finally, all projects should aim to increase diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in STEM. They should do this by focus on enabling all members of a community to have equitable access to and participate in the innovation economy. Projects should also seek to provide historically underserved and underrepresented communities with access to training and other tools to succeed. Applicants should have relevant employer partners who are willing to demonstrate commitments to hiring program participants and promoting, promoting DEIA in their workplace. Now, let's get to the meat of this presentation and talk about the basics of how to submit an application and how applications will be scored. So let's go over the challenge timeline. 
as you know, at the application window opened on April 11th, 2023. We will be accepting applications for until April, until June 12th, 2023 um, at 11.59 p.m. The application window will close. On, we will review applica applications and make award selection during the summer of 2023. And we do plan to announce awards in late summer, early fall of 2023. Um, and then, of course, according to the NOFO, um, awarded projects will begin on November 1st, 2023. As with previous years of the STEM Talent Challenge, all applications must be submitted electronically. <laughs> However, this year, instead of submitting through Grants.gov, all applicants should submit through EDA's new Grants Management System, EDGE. In order to submit an application through EDGE, organizations must register with the system. Prior to registering with EDGE, an organization must also register with SAM.gov and obtain a unique entity identifier or UEI number. When you register your organization for EDGE, you will register one authorized representative. This will be the only official who has the authority to submit applications. The required file format for attachments is PDF and where appropriate, Microsoft Excel, i.e. for the budget narrative. The full application packet package must be submitted in order for an application to be reviewed and scored. Applications must consist of a maximum 10 page project narrative, a budget narrative, a series of standard forms and additional supporting documents. For a complete list of the documents that are required for your organization, please review the appendices of the NOFO, which can be found on EDA's website. As I just said, a complete application is required for all scored applications. A complete application has two categories of components, project design and substance, which includes documents that show your project's focus, as well as the level of support from partners, and forms and supporting documentation, which are standard requirements for EDA's grants. For project design and substance, you will need a project narrative, which includes the sections listed listed in the NOFO and on an upcoming slide. You will also need your budget narrative and staffing plan to show how the funds will be spent and the level of expertise that you will have working on the project. Next, you are required to submit matching share commitment letters, which show that the funding for your match has been secured. For non-public entities, a letter or resolution showing that the project is supported by the state or local government is also required. Finally, you are encouraged to submit letters from employers and project partners to show that your project is supported and would have a high likelihood of resulting in high wage, high growth jobs for program participants. A complete application also includes a set of standard forms and other supporting documents. The SF-424 is the application for federal assistance and includes the top line da data for your project, including overall federal request and match, organization name and address, and the contact information connected to your organization. The SF-424A is the budget information form for non-construction programs. This form includes the line item budget for your entire project, both for your federal request and match. The CD-511 and SFLLL are both forms related to project-related lobbying activities. Spot compliance refers to the requirement in some states to file your project with a state single point of contact. More information about SPOC and whether or not your state requires this submission can be found in the NOFO. Organizational documents, specifically the Articles of Incorporation, Bylaws, and Current Certificate of Good Standing, are required for non for non public or, or for nonprofit organizations. If you are utilizing indirect costs in your budget, you need to either submit your negotiated indirect cost rate agreement from another federal agency or a signed statement that you are choosing to utilize the 10% de minimis. Finally, you are required to submit an attachment of your project service area by FIPS code. This should be submitted as an attachment to the SF-424A and there is, or the SF-424. And there is a template on the STEM website for this attachment. 
Now let's really dig into the project narrative and the information that we are expecting to find in it. We expect successful applications to follow the format listed in the NOFO, which is meant to align with the merit review criteria. In section one, you will include your project description and overview. Section 1A is your executive summary, a 250 word or less description of your project that includes your project title, identifies the applicant name and type of eligible applicant. Section 1B is where you will include information about your organization's vision and mission, as well as its goals. What roles does your organization currently play in the innovation ecosystem, and how do those roles fit in with the goals of your organization? How are you positioned to support a technology entrepreneurship system by strengthening its STEM talent pipeline? In Section 2, you will include information about your regional innovation resources and the talent needs of the innovation ecosystem. In Section 2A, you will describe the project service area, the target participants served, and stakeholders leveraged, and the communities or regions as assets and opportunities. This description and the region described should directly correspond to questions 14 and 16 on the SF424. SF Make sure to list all areas of expected impact for your project. In section 2B, well, you will describe your needs assessment and its finding. In this section, you should describe the unmet skilled STEM worker needs of your area's employer base. In section 3, you will present your proposed scope of work. In section three, you will outline your, 3A, you will outline your problems and solutions, explaining the problems that you are trying to solve and the solutions you are proposing. You should speak here about your proposed how your proposed solutions align with EDA's investment priorities and describe how the solutions would align with specific regional opportunities or would tackle structural challenges. In 3B, you will explain how achievable your solution is. Have you already piloted the idea? Do you have examples of where this or similar solutions have been implemented before? What kind of research have you done that leads you to believe that your outcomes are achievable? How will the project prepare participants for employment in the industries or businesses driving innovation in the region? In section 3C, you will talk about the specific stakeholder groups that the project will impact. How will you target participants and how will your project benefit historically underserved populations and increase DEIA and your regional innovation economy? Next, in section 3D, you will include your scope of work. This section should be limited to one page and should include information about the activities that you will undertake and the milestones and deliverables that will indicate positive progress. You should include information about your project partners and a brief description of their roles on the project. Next, in section four, you will go into your collaboration efforts. Section 4A, you will talk about your partnerships. Here you will describe your partner network, including current, former, and future partnerships or working relationships that will be working on this project. Please describe their roles and responsibilities and include information about the effectiveness of past collaboration efforts. Partners should include regional innovators and employers who are looking for qualified talent to fill quality jobs. In section 4B, you should include information about how your project will include increase diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in STEM. You should include information about how you will reach out to new and diverse stakeholders and program participants and how you plan to engage stakeholders from target populations, including HBCUs, tribal colleges and universities, and or minority serving institutions. Next, in section five, you will talk about your measurable goals and impacts. You will outline evidence and data-based anticipated goals, including outputs and outcomes. Anticipated goals should be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound, or SMART. Job placement of program participants in, into quality jobs in the STEM-related fields of study should be included as a goal for all projects. In Section 5A, you will describe your existing data infra infrastructure and or your plans for acquiring a data and client management system to track metrics. Finally, in section six, you will outline your sustainability plan, including anticipated challenges and potential barriers, 
and include an outline for how the project will become self-sustaining once grants funds have been expended. Now that we've talked about the project narrative, we'll move on to the budget narrative and the budget documents overall. In general, all budget documents, specifically the budget narrative and the SF424A, as well as the budget question on the 424, should be consistent. What does that mean? It means that you should make sure that the numbers on all of these documents match. Each line of the budget narrative should clearly indicate the budget category from the 424A to which the line item corresponds, a description of the intended use of funds for each line item, and for every matching share contribution, a corresponding matching share commitment letter that clearly indicates how funds will be used. To make budget creation easier, we have included an Excel budget template on the STEM Talent Challenge website. We highly recommend that you utilize this template to ensure consistency throughout your application. As with previous year's competition, a one-to-one -one match is required. What this means is that for every dollar of federal funds that you are requesting, you must bring at least one dollar of matching funds. When you are thinking about your budget, you will think about the overall project budget. That is, your overall budget will consist of both the federal share and matching share combined. And you should think of your budget holistically. In general, recipients of these funds will need to expend matching share at the same rate as they expend federal share. This means that as you spend federal share, you should think about how you also spend corresponding matching share. When it comes to matching share funds, as we stated on a previous slide, all funds must be verified and documented in a corresponding matching share commitment letter even if the funds are all coming from you as the applicant. I repeat, all matching funds must be documented by a commitment letter, even if provided by the applicant. Commitment letters must directly state whether or not the contribution is cash or in-kind. If, if the contribution is in-kind, you must also provide evaluation and description. For example, if a partner is contributing legal services, you could provide an hour valuation by giving the hourly rate and number of hours that are projected to be contributed to the project. You should also state whether the contribution is from a non-federal source or if from a federal source, you should provide documentation that it is explicitly authorized by the statute to be used as a source of matching share. Finally, the letter should state that at the time of the award, the matching share would be committed to the project, available as needed, and neither conditioned nor encumbered in any way that would prevent it from being used in this way. All letters must be signed by someone with the authority to provide funds to the project. If an applicant is a nonprofit organization, a non-public institution of higher education, a public-private partnership, a science or research park, a federal laboratory, or an economic development organization or similar entity, then they must include a letter or resolution that shows that the application is supported by one or more states, political subdivis subdivisions of a state, such as a county, or a tribal organization. This letter or resolution should encompass all or a substantial portion of the region that would be served under the proposed project. Please note that support from federal officials does not meet this requirement. Examples of authorities that may indicate support for federal officials, um, that may indicate such support include state and local executive branch officials, i.e. state governors, state cabinet members, mayors, or other municipal executives, state and local legislators, such as state legislators and city council persons, or native organizations. If the applicant is a state, Indian tribe, city, or other political subdivision of a state, this requirement does not apply. Applicants are required to identify their proposed primary service area or areas by county or counties. These should be compiled in Excel and uploaded as an attachment to the SF-424. Please note that this is a change from the previous two challenges, 
where you were asked to include FIPS codes in your project narrative. That is no longer required, but we do ask for the attached list. For more information on FIPS codes, please see the CEMSIS website linked directly on this slide. You may have noticed this year that the program has a focus on quality job placement outcomes. To substantiate the goals outlined in your proposal, we are encouraging applicants to include letters from employer partners to show that the project is likely to result in quality jobs for program participants. These letters could reflect an employer's willingness to serve as a work and learn partner and or to hiring program completers. These letters should show that you have a strong relationships with employers who corroborate the demand for skills training. While these letters are optional, they may help applicants score more favorably in merit review. Which brings me to our merit review criteria. Each application is evaluated for technical completeness first, so we only score complete applications from eligible applicant types. This process is called technical review and happens prior to merit review. Once we have taken out incomplete and ineligible applications, every application is scored on a five point scale using the seven criteria listed on this slide. Strength of regional partnerships and assets looks at whether or not there are partners, particularly employers and training providers who would support the project's main functions. Is the project connected to STEM industry leaders and businesses driving innovation in the region? Is there a clearly defined need for those innovative businesses for of those innovative businesses for employer for employees with the skills that this project would provide to its trainees? Do the partners have clearly defined roles? Proposed solution considers whether the proposed solution is clearly stated and aligned with the regional needs. Does it effectively leverage assets in the region and align with the opportunity? Is the proposed solution even achievable? Does the application clearly identify target participants and how those participants will be reached? To what extent does the solution incorporate components of the registered apprenticeship model? Diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility considers the extent to which the project will ensure the benefits of the project are shared across all affected communities. Will the project have a positive impact on promoting diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility among STEM fields and in the project's region? Will it actively encourage and solicit participation from target entities from underserved communities? Measurable goals and impacts looks at whether the solution has clear goals against which to measure the project's success, including measure of measuring impacts on historically underserved populations and areas. Proposed goals should be measurable, reasonable, and achievable during and beyond the project goal. Do goals include placement into high quality jobs in the STEM related fields of field of training? Continued impacts considers the likelihood that the investment will continue to deliver impact. How will the need for STEM talent be filled after the term of the grant? How will services adapt to fit future talent and skills needs? Will proposed partners enhance the sustainability of the project? And or is there a financial plan to sustain the project beyond the award? Is that plan feasible? Budget and staffing looks at the budget narrative and staffing plan proposed and whether the operations and management capabilities and experience of the applicant organization and team demonstrate the ability to successfully execute the proposed project. Finally, Alignment with STEM talent challenge goals considers whether the application aligns with the, um, with the goal to drive regional innovation by building STEM capable talent and on the quality and clarity of the application's responses to the prompts in the NOFO. Based on the combined score on these seven criteria, applications are selected for award. Now that we have talked about what needs to go in your application and how applications will be scored, let's go over some highlights of the previous and current STEM Talent Challenge grantees. While this year's program has some differences, it may help you in your application to see the types of projects we have funded before. Based on the need for basic laboratory skills in Philadelphia's biotech industry, 
University City Science Center have used STEM Talent Challenge funding to expand their building and understanding of Lab Basics Bulb program. This program combines hands-on training and work-based learning to prepare participants for careers in the booming biotech industry. Since launching in July 2021, the program has served 48 participants, engaged 19 companies, and resulted in nine jobs so far. Howard Community College expanded its cybersecurity work and learn program to reach new employers and participants, particularly those from underrepresented populations. The program included customized training packages, combining certifications with hands-on work-based learning through apprenticeships and internships. Since launching in February 2021, the program has placed 52 students into internships and registered apprenticeships. Run for Women in St. Louis, Missouri partnered with Maryville University and Greater St. Louis Incorporated to help fill the needs of employers utilizing geospatial technology through the creation of the Geospatial Analyst Program. They provided letters of commitment from employers to hire graduates of the program. Since beginning in February 2022, three of four geospatial graduates have been placed in target careers. They plan to train and place multiple additional cohorts throughout the course of the project. To see all of our previous grantees, please visit our website. Now, let's move on to discuss a few frequently asked questions. What has changed from the previous year's challenge? Well, maximum funding request has doubled from 250,000 to 500,000. Submission now takes place via EDGE rather than grants.gov. And all projects should aim to accomplish all three program goals instead of just some of the program goals. That is, all projects should aim to accomplish STEM work-based learning and training, increase regional innovation capacity to hire in innovative industries, and increase DEIA in STEM fields. And finally, there is a focus on job placement outcomes um, that was not as highlighted in previous years, and employer letters, including commitments to hire, are now encouraged. My organization received a previous year EDA STEM Talent Challenge grant. Are we eligible to apply again? Organizations who received awards under previous STEM Talent Challenge competitions are eligible to apply for this year's challenge if they have completed all activities, including final reporting, prior to the start date of the new award, which is November 1st, 2023. Can this funding be used to directly support program participants, such as through participant wages or stipends? Yes, just as the, within the FY21 competition, STEM Talent Challenge funding can be used to directly support program participants through incentive methods such as wages or stipends. Funding can also be spent on wraparound services such as childcare, transportation, and other costs associated with, this, with attending training. Please note that costs associated with housing, i.e. rent, utilities, et cetera, are generally not allowed under EDA grants. How much match is required? Should, how should it be documented? And is there a benefit to overmatching? So first off, a minimum one-to-one -one match is required for all applications. This means that for every dollar of federal funding requested, you must bring one dollar of matching funds, either cash or in-kind. Um, matching funds should be documented through a commitment letter, even if all of that match is coming from the applicant. Um, these letters should include the numeric value of the contribution and evaluation for any in-kind contributions. That is, how did you get to the value that you listed? They should also state whether the funds are committed, the state that the funds are committed, available, and unencumbered. Applicants are allowed to bring more match than the minimum if this, if this is needed for the project, but there's no benefit in scoring to bringing more than the required match. I repeat, there is no benefit in scoring to bringing more than the required match, though it is allowed. 
So that brings us to the end of our presentation today. Um, for additional questions, please reach out to us at oie at eda.gov and visit our website, eda.gov slash funding slash programs slash STEM hyphen challenge. Thank you for attending this webinar today and please reach out if you do have any additional questions.